many of you have been to the History Center before? Great, so a lot of you. How many of you have seen the exhibit across the hall called Oklahoma to Boobies? Well, when you leave here, you should go across the hall and, and you can get in with your pass. And basically, um, they have set up an exhibit. How long has it been running, Jeff? Two years? Uh, 18 months. 18 months. And so what they've done is they've gone through and looked at all the different people from Oklahoma that are succeeding in the movie industry in a wide variety of ways. And that kind of gave us the idea that we should start honoring people. So we started this Oklahoma Film Icon Award um, two years ago, about the same time. And then we've partnered with the History Center to look at who are the different people that are making a difference and how do we kind of tie them back to Oklahoma because we have a really growing film industry here. And so that's what today is. Today we are highlighting the th three of the four icons that we've chosen. And we're starting with a guy named Fritz Kirsch. And uh, Jeff Moore is going to do, do his introduction for us, but, but I worked for Fritz the first time I was the assistant. The first movie I ever worked on I got because of Fritz Kirsch. He called me and said, I heard that you quit your job and that you're going to start over and make movies and I can get you a free internship on a job with Burt Reynolds, on a movie with Burt Reynolds, so I did. And, uh, and then the first time I, I assisted directed a movie, it was for Fritz Kirsch. And, so, and then I also went to grad school at OCU and he was the head of the department. So uh, basically every single part of my career was because of Fritz and so we were very excited to get honored because it's not only me, I think about 80% of the people working on film in Oklahoma went through either the OCU or the OCCC program. And so he has really influenced every single crew member that's working on every film. So to introduce Fritz and, um, and his great friend that's in town to help us celebrate, I'll introduce Jeff Moore. Jeff Moore is, is the director of the Oklahoma Pops Museum. Over coming in Tulsa, has been a long time employee here with the, with the History Center. And Bob had something come up last minute and Jeff agreed to step in and take over all the introductions. So be nice to him. He just found out about this this morning. He's an awesome, awesome friend of Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Again, welcome to the Oklahoma History Center, and uh, I'm glad that a lot of you have been here before, and I'm also glad a lot of you have not been to the Oklahoma the Movies exhibit. You definitely want to check that out. We had a, a, a really incredible um, journey discovering all these amazing people from Oklahoma that have had such an uh, incredible impact on film. Um, from the very beginning, from uh, 1904, when um, um, Thomas Edison, almost said Alexander Graham Bell, you know, one of those early 20th century inventors, Thomas Edison sent a film crew out to Oklahoma to capture the West. And ever since then, Oklahoma has been at the forefront of the film. And we're so excited to partner with Dead Center and honor these 2014 Oklahoma Icon Award winners. And our first uh, person we're going to honor today and, and have on stage to discuss um, their career and um, um, where the film industry is going as it relates to technology and some new innovations is Fritz Kirsch from Oklahoma City. He uh, came and started the uh, film department, film program at Oklahoma City Community College, went on to uh, create the program at Oklahoma City University. So if any of you students here want to further your education in film, he's definitely someone you need to know. Dead Center celebrated the 30th anniversary of his uh, film that he directed, Stephen King's Children of the Corn, last night, in fact. There was a screening that was part of the festival. Today, Fritz will be joined by George Parra from Los Angeles, and he was executive producer on two recent Academy Award winning films, um, The um, American Hustle, and you see that? Great, great movie. And then Silver Linings Playbook. So I'd like to welcome Fritz and George to the stage. And they will um, have a conversation a little bit, and then we'll probably have time for some questions. We're we'll already in conversation. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to be here, and it's great to talk to you all. And it's really, really wonderful to see the enthusiasm that's growing in the state for the process of making film and the ability to speak through the channel of film. It's really quite important to me that. Um, the idea of film not being a cat on a skateboard uh, on YouTube is being brought up through high school, but in fact we're learning how to say something just as much as we might learn how to say something when we write or we put together a text in our social studies class. But in our case, we are using the visual and the oral mediums to say something important. It is a language that is beyond um, just a very simple um, Study is a very complex language, like we might learn German or French or something, but once you do learn that, you're able to say things in a much more remarkable, more universal, more culturally crossing kind of um, way. 
So it's really nice to see that you have that enthusiasm for it, or someone twisted your arm and come here, I don't know what you think. Know, Our charge this morning really is just to have a conversation perhaps about what we think the direction of film might be. Um, as you know, it's developed over the last hundred years in a certain form, but I think we'll both agree that within the last 20, the greatest changes have occurred, uh, possibly because the medium itself, the base of what is recorded, has changed from the film process to a digital electronic process. This may not seem like a big thing to most people because, gosh, all we do is change the camera from something big with a bunch of film in it to something that is small and more compact that does things. But if we look at the financial side of it, George can explain great depth on that, huge changes. If we look at the performance sides of things, huge changes. If we look at the outcome, look at the difference between Godzilla and, oh, Dirty Harry, a traditionally made film film. <coughs> And you can see how now computer-generated images, which are now called computer-generated frame, it's not an image, the whole picture is virtual, has changed the way we approach it. How many films do you do on film right now? Um, yeah, it's pretty rare. It, it's the ratio is enormously getting smaller and smaller, sort of like when there used to be film cameras, you know, to take pictures of your family, and everybody had those, and then slowly, it turned digital and slowly turned more digital. Now, who owns a film camera? You know, who develops film for still photos? Nobody. So that's sort of where it's, well, you might, if, that's great. <laughs> it's pretty rare and it's a great art. It's the dark room and all that stuff. I did that in college. But, you know, it, it's getting smaller and smaller. Um, some directors are just stubborn and, you know, they just hang in there and they, 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 they think it's the best and the purest. and so on and so forth, and then a lot of the old-time directors like Scorsese and people like that have just conformed and just say, it looks great, I can't tell the difference. <laughs> um, David O. Russell is one of the last dinosaurs. He shoots on the film. So American Hustle was all film? Film. Now, yeah. let me interject, there is a step that was developed in the 90s, digital intermediate. Yeah. It's a process that changes the film into a digital form and you actually are enabled to take a 35 millimeter film and put it into the computer to manipulate it to allow it to have layers and do all the cool things. That's the normal process now. Yeah. So it's not what used to be prior to that, which was film and then you processed that and you worked with the actual tangible material and you cut it and you glued it and you got loaded because the vapors were too strong. <laughs> <laughs> all these terrible things. Anyway, um, uh, so now, you do, it's a hybrid process. And so digital is very much involved in it. It's the evolution of film. Well, and, and film, 100 years, like you say, in the business, I mean, I've been in the business going on 28 years, and every year something technically sort of changes. Every single year. Like when we first got into visual effects, say 15 or so you know, years ago, when it really became big with Lucas and ILM and all those companies like that, it was sort of a limited situation, but now literally you can just tell a director, and it could be a young, new director, it could be a seasoned director, you can say, basically, any, or a writer, which is important, anything your mind's eye wants to see on the screen, they can do. Anything. You name it. Spaceship landing here, right here on the stage, you know, they can do it. So it's, it's quite remarkable, you know, because you can do, create anything. What does that do for the process of, I mean, inspiration is wonderful, and, and, and as we work together, we know, we get these ideas while we're doing it, and in the heat of the battle, oh my gosh, let's make that spaceship land here, so let's make a change into our plans for the day. But what does that do for the financial aspects of making a product for a price to sell to a public to make a profit? I mean, that's what movies are all about. Uh, I'm sorry, we're in a museum, you talk about art, but it's not art. Someone always makes a dollar off of what we do. Um, well, visual effects by nature are expensive, very, very expensive, but they've gotten slowly more advanced and therefore less expensive. So, you know, um, what used to be astronomical, like, oh my God, you can't afford that. Now filmmakers can't afford, afford 
and it's getting far more affordable for many people. Um, I mean, I just saw Godzilla last two weekends ago with my son. Has anybody seen Godzilla? I mean, that's like, you know, that wasn't a real dinosaur, by the way. San Francisco is still alive. Um, but it's just amazing to watch that. It's like, my God. And that's all digital frame. It's all, it's, you know, none of that existed. It's all done magically, you know. And then you put the actor in the foreground with a giant green screen behind him, and you say, run, there's a giant lizard behind you. <laughs> you look worried, and it looks fantastic. It's seamless. <laughs> She's out cold. That's all I can think of. That's a joke between us. Always, always. How does it work for a producer who has to plan on that? How do you plan on an actor who normally works in an environment, uh, an exchange between them and another human being, they're interacting, now put in front of an imaginary, soon-to-be added environment, and it's definitely a way of the future, and it's continuing. People, you know, your big target audience is a 16 to 22, 25 year old audience. It's the big movie going audience. Teenagers in the early 20s, they love visual effects. They love, you know, fantasy, and you know, so it's a big, big deal. That's why, you know, there are 200 million dollar budgets. Yeah. Um, my process isn't quite as complicated because I don't produce those kind of films. I know a lot of people that do, and it takes months to figure it out. Months upon months upon months. And it's very complex, and even then, it's like, you know, a visual effects budget will come in at literally $50 million, and they go, well, we only have 40. So there's always a fight. No matter how big your budget is, you never have enough money. So um, even if it's $100,000, you don't have enough money. So, can be a hundred million dollars, you still don't have enough money. It's, it's, I don't know how it's always been the case. It's careful. Uh, there's a friend of mine, another producer, who told me a story. And George, I just wanted to know if you've done this. During the process of making the film, having to go back to the financiers over a dinner and say, I just need another two million dollars. And they <laughs> give you two million dollars before dessert. Have you ever gone through anything? No, I usually get fired. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, no, <laughs> Definitely not. No. Um, <laughs> so, but that happens a lot. Yeah, that happens a lot. Um, so, um, I just want to touch base on what Fritz was saying at the beginning, which is really interesting to me because I've had the good fortune of uh, working on films all over the world. Um, and the great thing about film in the in our world, as we see it now, and probably forever and ever. Um, is that it's a very universal language. I could be shooting in Italy, or in Prague, or in, um, I've got a project now in China, and I'm about to go visit them, and apparently it's the same scenario where everything is the same, the language is the same worldwide, which is very interesting. And the equipment looks the same, and the grip wears the same grip belt. And yeah, so everything's the same everywhere. It's very wonderful because you suddenly feel you walk into that little environment of a film set and you could be anywhere in the world, which is fascinating. So in China, they come, they ask where the coffee is and the food and when they quit in the hours and all, just like, you know, I, I haven't been there yet, but yeah, I imagine you would. Um, but in Europe, yes, in uh, South America and Mexico, yeah. You it's just all came the same. from, um, you mentioned yesterday, from Europe, turn, location, scouting for three weeks? Come on, yeah, so we were right. looking at, uh, look, yeah, we would, no. <laughs> a little bit. Okay. Uh, um, we were looking for locations for Kevin Reynolds' picture called Clavius, which is a Gladiator 38 oh, kind of movie, so we had the fortune. Okay, to this brings us back to this digital idea. Yep. Roman sword and sandal kind of thing. How much will be recreated digitally? How much digital frame? will be in that film? Um, probably 25%, because there are a lot of places that look like that still. So it will be, will stage and block and, and photograph in front of ruins and then you electronically and to it, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there are places like in Morocco where we found a quarry set where they've shot like Lawrence of Arabia and um, Spartacus and one of those crazy films where they built the uh, Kingdom of Heaven set, 
Who's it? Giant. It's a giant, like three football fields giant. Yeah, it's in the middle of the desert. It's still there and you can shoot it. You just have to get there. <laughs> is it a tourist attraction? It's somewhat, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you would enhance to that. Like if you wanted to include that set into Jerusalem. So you had Jerusalem in the background. Or if you wanted, you know, if you wanted to add a Godzilla coming over the hillside, you could add that. <laughs> so it just depends on what you want. So it's, it's really starting to become more, every film has some kind of virtual digital element to make the experience of the viewer more engaged. Yeah, even a lot of the films that I produce um, are uh, what I call talking heads. Uh, movies like Sideways and you know um, The Descendants or Nebraska or things like that. So it's literally it's not a digital movie. It's not about monsters and aliens and things like that. It's about people talking and so on. So every film has a digital element. Uh, what one of the easy things to put in that you have to put in is a cleanup. So like if there's a boom that dips into the frame and nobody caught it, hypothetically, and then you look at it later and go, oh, wow, there's a boom in the shot. You can digitally just remove it. Hmm. Or if there's a cable that shouldn't have been in the shot, or if there's just digital cleanup, and that's added to every budget now. Oh, really? Yeah. That must help the producer a lot. So during the process, you can say, well, we can be more elastic, let's be more forgiving. We've made a mistake, so let's just go on. We'll fix it and clean it. We'll fix it and bust. Yeah. We'll fix it and bust. How much, what's the percentage given to cleanup in budget 5%, 1%? It's pretty small, but I mean, it still adds up. You get to probably put in, in a $20 million picture, you put in uh, $100,000. Wow. Yeah. Just who, to have it. Who, you may not use it, but... Who, who does that work? Here are students that think maybe careers might be open for them. Uh, digital companies, digital uh, visual effects companies, like an ILM or like, there's, like, there's thousands of those companies now. And... Um, uh, they'll do everything from making Godzilla to cleaning up a cable that runs through the shot. Or if um, you want to reframe a shot, you can digitally, oh, yeah. you, know, you can do all kinds of stuff digitally. Anything, yeah. like I said before, anything you want to do in your mind's eye, you can do it. I was reading a piece about the uh, digital process for the cinematographer for the actual acquisition of the image, that's the technical term. And now, instead of trying to make the image perfect, the idea is to make the most information present in the image. So um, what would traditionally have been called an overexposed image is now the goal, so that there can be more detail in things to later be changed by the digital artists who enhance the work of the cinematographer who used to previously be the man that no one or woman argued with about the look. So now someone's work, who used to be in charge of something as important as the aesthetic, is being said or told, it's great, we'll just take it from here. I don't know if you can, I don't know if the old school guys will take that much. Well, you know, it depends on the director. A lot of, things, a lot of times you don't have to change much. Uh, uh, for example, Alexander Payne from Omaha, he doesn't change much. He shoots what he wants, and he knows what he wants, and it's pretty simple, streamlined. So it depends on the director. Do you think it's making, um, with the directors you work with, those who are new or haven't um, gone deeply into the process um, more, uh, let's say, easier to become the director these days? There's more forgiveness in the process, and more people come to your side to help the process finish? It's possible. It's possible. But I mean, everything costs money. so you generally don't want to have to change everything after you've shot it digitally because you can't afford it. So you might want to get, you know, 98% of what you get that day. So right now, the, the process for making film does follow the pattern of what has happened over the history of film in terms of uh, things are thought out and strategies are in place, uh, ideas based on uh, how much it will cost or organized way before. What might be the items or the things that are completely different? What's changed? the most for you in the last couple of years? Overall, the whole process, beginning to end. You stopped directing. <laughs> well, yeah, that's good. So anyway, <laughs> I got this job parking cars. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
the thing that's changed the most is, is probably the visual effects. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. And digital cameras. It's just it, visual effects. It's very computerized and very, very complex, and it changes continuously. There's always more progress. I mean, with everything that's electronic in your household or in our cars or anywhere in the world, or you know, everything's evolving. So I'd be curious to see what happens hypothetically 10 years from now. I was introduced to a product that just amazed me and, and made me think about closing the loop in terms of the history of cinema. And as you know, early cinema was an individual exploration, the box that you looked in and you turned the crank, the kinescope, and you watched flickered images of stills being passed before you at a certain speed. And you thought, wow, look, there's a train pulling in a station. There's some activity. And it was just a loop of things. But it was an individual exploration. And then it turned into a group exploration. Let's put that project on the wall and we'll show it in a, in a coffee shop. And then it turned to theaters and then stories came into it and it got bigger and CinemaScope and digital and all kinds of great things. But in the last couple of years, the idea of virtual immersion has happened and goggles are now being manufactured. It's called Oculus Rift. And it has taken the frame of the motion picture image and eliminated it from our periphery. So it's projected on goggles. So we're back to the individual being immersed into an environment that they think is almost real. And I think that what we'll see is not that George will be making a movie anymore, or I'll be able to make a movie for you as a viewer, but you as the wearer of the goggles, immersed in this non-peripheral environment that moves with you in any direction you look or orient, enables you to be George, the producer because you cause the actions to happen and therefore you get to interact as the operator with whatever the story is that you'd like to have happen. So we're getting away from the presentation of information to the, I think, let's talk about the audience now. Let's see how people receive this. Let's put them into it. Have you seen this, Oculus Rift? I, I read about it briefly, but I don't know much about it, to tell you the truth. It's, it's kind of it's, it's a very scary kind of thing, but to me, what I celebrate in reading and learning about it is that a young man at 18 years old in his garage developed it about three or four years ago and then refined it and then just recently sold it to YouTube or Twitter. Facebook. Facebook. A million? Billion? Two billion? A lot. Oh, two billion has other Yeah. I mean, let me see. I could buy the Clippers. I could buy Oculus. Clippers. Clippers. <laughs> Clippers. <laughs> sure. So it's kind of nice. And I, I think that if we look at history as a way, as a usable past, it's pushing us to develop things that are far more interesting than what we're doing or the techniques that we've done. And now we have all this wonderful technology. But it's cool to look at what was done and just recreate it now with a different technology. It's going to push us into a different area. So. But I think there's always, a, I mean, when you come to like a film festival, like all the film festivals that I've been attending and get invited to, and you know, there's always a great need for straight narrative. Okay. That was like the bare bones of filmmaking. So hopefully that'll never go away. Because you know, there's nothing better than a great dramatic scene at a dinner table. And, you know, it's just, that's what cinema started out to be. And I would vote for that. Never go away. I, I'd vote for that, and I believe you 100% if it's followed by a car chase or an axe murder. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my kind of films, the commercial films, you know. She's out cold. She's out cold. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so anyway, all right, we saw our film last night that used that line, and it was quite funny. <laughs> I don't know how to um, you know, here we are chatting and taking up your time, and I'm sure you have particular questions you'd like to ask, and you know, you've got a great resource here, so please, I'll, I'll pass the microphone, we can uh, include you in the conversation and dialogue. Um, what do you think? What are your thoughts? What can we ask? You're talking about... I'll jump off. <laughs> My wife is here, she doesn't hear so well. I'm... <laughs> uh, you're talking about Oculus Rift and how the viewer is immersed into a kind of movie state where they get to choose what happens. So it will be, do you think it will be more like video games almost? Like a video game movie where you are like the character? Well initially, um, Oculus Rift is designed for a 16 year old to play. 
is being accepted and being produced for the, the game environment. But George hit it on the head. I'm 17, I'm 19, I'm 25, I really don't want to play video games, I want to watch a story. So why can't we adapt that technology into the narrative structure or the execution of a narrative and provide information and stories to your age groups instead of the children that love to talk to people in China and play a game against them or whatever they do on those <laughs> games. It's kind of violent. But it, it won't be long. I think that the, you know, it's evolution. Things will change. Yeah. Although there is a concept right now that people call it, we're revolutionists. We're not evolutionists. We're here to absolutely embrace the digital world and we're going to make it digital and we, you know, we're not taking any more film. Then there are those who feel that, well, it'll slowly progress. Evolution. But, but I also think it has waves because um, one example is 3D. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, 3D was in the early 50s, I believe, or I don't know, something like that. And then it kind of went away for a long, long time. And then it came back really strong five, six years ago, I think, <laughs> seven, eight years ago. And now the trend is finding out that people actually don't like it as much as everybody thought they did. I thought 3D was uh, sponsored by Bayer Aspirin. <laughs> so that we watch the movie and then we take their medication because it always gets so, ahead. I think it, you know, these kind of technologies, <laughs> like these, you know, these glasses you're talking about, you know, they might catch on for a while and then they might disappear. Or, you know, it evolves. Cinerama, huge in the 50s to combat the interest in television and the ability to show film at home without having to go to a theater. All the theater goers were now staying at home. Movie makers were saying we're losing billions of dollars, millions at that time, uh, against this technology of television. Let's make the screen a spectacle. We don't have that anymore. We're back to internet. I want to see it when I want to see it. So yes, I think business is pushing it. Yeah. Yeah, and everybody's got home theaters. I mean, you can have a hundred inch screen very, uh, you know, affordably. Like that. And with great surround sound. And companies like Netflix are, you know, expanding because sit at home and would prefer to be at home and in the privacy of their, you know, and watch a great film. So there's nothing wrong with that as long as they're watching. How many of you like to watch films by yourself and how many like to go to the theater and interact with people and feel the environment and the laughter and the scare and all that? Popcorn. Pop yeah. <laughs> Popcorn. Yeah. Who eats that over caloric? <laughs> yeah. Not me. Anyway. <laughs> what other questions? Can we pass the microphone to you? Yeah, there's, she's right behind you. So I know there's all these different distribution channels with layers where you can see it in the theater, and then it can be distributed on cable, and then in your red box, and all these, and then internationally. Is it financially easier to make a film, and are we more likely to see a broader diversity of film because of that? Well, there's a, it helps because you know all your revenue is not coming straight from movie theater. So there's a huge aftermarket with everything you just talked about, whether it's airplanes, hotels, Netflix, uh, Apple TV, all that's paid for, so it helps It helps a lot. It's been a big um, support system for studios, for independent financiers, because there's more money coming in at the end. And a lot of people, frankly, would rather see, a lot of people would rather stay home, like I said as opposed to going to a movie theater, so now they, they're paying less sometimes, but yet they're, they're still paying to see it. So, yeah, it's a big deal. Going back to where I think you were going with the question about watching a, a movie by yourself versus a theater, I'm really concerned about how isolated humans are becoming. Uh, I'm really old, so I vaguely remember pre-air conditioning when folks used to sit outside and you would know your neighbors and now we all go home and we shut ourselves in and that's it. Um, and it is very different. You know, and if you're watching it through goggles, forget it. You don't even know what your dog or your child was doing, right? And that just really bothers me. Plus the light is coming from a different source. It's, it's not reflected is coming at you. So I don't know. That's a kind of a question, I think. I think it's a wonderful question. I don't know what the question is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bullshit. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait a minute. 
<laughs> Film is a, is a social medium, and it, there is a, I don't know if I have the word right, I don't want to sound smart, a, a psychosomatic kind of thing that goes on when you deal with an individual in the dark looking at a light, and there is a somewhat of a hypnotic thing, and a psychological uh, impact on the viewer. Um, it's a very powerful medium. We, as filmmakers, know where the viewer now will look and control that look to make them look there or there or there to increase the scare, the action, the impact of the activity and the content. We are aware of the light values, games, and the way they are manufactured um, go deeply into this area of psychological control so that they can control the viewer more carefully and very closely. And it's a very dangerous, almost um, propaganda-esque line that they are crossing. So we, um, and what I encourage a lot with students is to think about the ethics of what we get involved in. We have a very powerful tool, a tool that over the course of history and its, its history has been used for propaganda on a political or cultural level. And we must be respective of that and respect those things that we get to do. If we go out and make products that show people doing harm, we are directly involved with the process of those people who see our product growing up thinking that's okay. It's a very powerful thing. As, in my opinion, it becomes a more isolated experience, the idea of developing loyalties to each other, this social issue, starts to come into question. I'm watching the film, I don't care about that. I'm not loyal to you anymore. I won't participate in the family unit. I won't participate in my social unit. I won't hang out with my friends. I won't go outside to meet the neighbors. I am now disloyal to that social aspect, which will lead to, I won't be loyal to buy that product. I won't be loyal to the economics of what my age group and demographic has traditionally done. It's a very scary kind of thing. So I think that if we look at those in your age group and younger and start to educate the what is called media literacy or the ecology of media, how the system works. It's not biology and the grass growing when I say ecology. I'm talking about a systemic definition or a definition of an entire process and how they all fit together. I think students will become more educated and better speakers. They'll address issues more strongly as they grow. They won't be forced to stay back in third grade because now they'll be able to speak and write, having learned through the channel how to do that. It's unbelievable. But it is leading to a dangerous place, in my opinion, without uh, a check and a boundary. That was an answer. It came out of a great question. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it just what, the only thing I can say about that is yes, it is a very powerful medium. I've always said that in other interviews. When you're making a film, and all of you who will hopefully make a film in the future or have made films, if the right audience or a large audience in volume sees it, whether it's in America or anywhere in the world, it's powerful. You can change. I mean, I first thought of that when I did Sideways, and there was one line in the movie that changed the sale of Merlot. <laughs> Merlot wine but dropped like 21% nationwide. Wow. One line. The whole country said, I'm not drinking Merlot. <laughs> and I was like, wow. We actually just, just, I mean, it's powerful. That's just a small example, but it's, it's possible. And how many, how many, um, uh, how many phrase lines in America, like, I'll be back, or, you know, from movies, you know, that stick forever? You know, so it's, it, you know, you gotta be real careful what you're, what you say for a trip, because people are gonna look at it and go, oh, I love that, or I don't like it, or, it's powerful. I, uh, you know, <laughs> she's she's a she's a old. Everybody's gonna be saying that soon. She's not old. You'll get it later. Anyway, um, you're making a film and you read the story. It's on a piece of paper. It's a hundred and some pages long, 105, 120. And there are the printed lines. I'll be back. And you say as a producer, wow, that's a wonderful moment. That's going to be indelible. That will make our audience respond. This is something cool. You go out and buy t-shirts right away to put that line on to sell to make more money. It's all designed, isn't it? I think, no, I actually think a lot of it. Work with me, babe. <laughs> <laughs> My experience is a lot of it's just, it just happens. Yeah. Magically, you don't even Culture. realize it. 
It's like, oh wow, everyone likes that line. Yeah. Like it was, you know, I mean, I was a PA, but I didn't know. Yeah. But no one knows anything when we go into making a film, really, and, and these, these um, windfalls happen. But people are quick to take advantage of, that's a wonderful line, we'll turn it into a cup, into a record, into a, a book, we'll uh, go across the media lines and we'll make something out of it. This is a, an interesting, George said something about, you make a film and it makes so much money. These films don't make so much money only. They make so much money for their entire life. In other words, Terminator was made in the 80s. It made a lot of money when it came out in terms of sales. That would be the ticket. That's what people call the box office. But then it went to home entertainment market. It went into airlines. It is something we can buy at, at um, Walmart today. It still makes money. So even though the big, attractive $100 million income is there, there's a trickle from all over the world, every nickel here and there, that adds up to another few million dollars every year for a product that has nothing to do but sit there on a shelf. Very comparable to music. Fantastic. You know, the Rolling Stones song from 30 years ago will make music forever. Yeah. It's very similar, very similar. Uh, question? I got the microphone, yay. Um, I just wanted to take it back to the personal versus the public. And two of your films show both sides because American Hustle was a personal side of a public historical fact, whereas The Silver Lining Playbook was a very, very intensely personal story. And yet in writing, of course, the more personal it is, the more universal it is. And so what I learned last night at Harmontown is that, yes, um, whoever, did anybody here see Harmontown last night? So Harmontown showed that while people are watching Facebook and Twitter, we are forming community in different ways. So people are forming their community online and on Twitter and on podcasts and Facebook. So that gave me hope for the future that people aren't isolating. But I wanted to ask you, um, how do you decide your next story? I mean, do you go for the personal or the public, or what is that kernel of decision? Uh, it's, it's kind of a fairly simple answer. It's just good material, uh, whether it's personal or not. Um, you're correct in saying that American Muscle was a, you know, based on a true story about a mayor, Carmen Polito, in New Jersey. And uh, Silver Lining's Playbook was a very personal script written by David Russell, who wrote both those scripts. Um, so it's just stories. Whether they're personal or not, if they're good, you know it. At least you hope you know it. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a good example. There's David Russell, you know, he um, several nominations for him in the last few years, uh, going back to um, uh, The Fighter, followed by Silver Linings Playbook, when I met him, followed by American Hustle. They're all different, you know, two were sort of, or actually two of them are based on real people. The Fighter was as well as American Hustle, and um, Silver Linings is basically based on his son, because his son is that person, Bradley Cooper. So um, um, it's just good material. It really doesn't matter what it is. I mean, you know, the first person that read Star Wars probably went, wow, what's this? Let's do this. It sounds like a good idea. You know, or Indiana Jones or Gone with the Wind. I, you know, just good material. It doesn't, for me, it doesn't, any genre work. I have a question about budget. Um, when you're doing a big film like, I don't know, Godzilla, or you're doing a smaller film, even though it's a large budget to me, like uh, Sideways, and those those are still a huge budget to me. Um, how do you, how flexible are people's salaries? I know that actors sometimes do what they call their Oscar project on a cheaper pay scale than they would a major film like Godzilla. So how flexible are everybody's salaries on the film? It's a good question. Fritz, don't get 
<laughs> it's a good question. Um, uh, let's say hypothetically Godzilla was a two hundred million dollar budget, right? Something like that. I don't even know. It was a lot. But, um, and Nebraska was, I'm guessing, Nebraska that I did last two years ago was just under fourteen million dollars. Okay, now all these films, as opposed to small independent films or student films, they're all unionized. The unions come into play, and the unions have thresholds of payment, a scale base, and then so like on a picture like Nebraska, everyone basically works for scale. And the union, the unions all the way across the board dictate those those levels. So I can't pay a person less than I think there's a round up numbers ten dollars an hour. And then when you go to make Godzilla, it's just a bigger bigger scope. And so-and-so's agent can say, look, he's not gonna work for scale on a $200 million movie. He's gonna work for $15 an hour or $12 an hour, and so on and so forth. So it just depends on the budget. Everything, like you said, the, the, the actors themselves. Um, I'll give you an example, and it's no secret. Um, George Clooney on Descendants, who is a, I think it was a $10 million quote, he did it for $500,000 because it's his low budget quote for small films. So everybody, does that answer your question? It just really depends yeah. on the size of the budget. Because it's like, how do the actors negotiate that against the union? Because an actor- There's also a scale for the union, for the, you know, okay. scale actors like uh, 4,800 a week. They just make their agents look crazy yeah, yeah, well, the agents are crazy. So. <laughs> <laughs> the agents in the audience? <laughs> I deal with them all day long. Yeah. So fun to deal with. Uh, love those guys. She's on cold. Yeah, she's on cold. Uh, we'll put her in the next three pictures. Yeah, exactly. She's on cold. Um, so the scale for an actor is 4800 a week. Think about it. So the agents are very uh, aggressive. <laughs> I have a question. Um, do I need? I am Melissa Sue. Hi, it's another having you. Thank you, Fritz. This is a great thing for me as a Latino filmmaker. And my question is, um, what is the future for Latino producers, directors, and writers now in the independent, you know, independent field? What do you? What is your advice for you know to me and for everybody else? There's a, there's a huge market in America. Huge. It, it's just now there's a lot of articles that have been written. You can Google them. In the last year about the Latino market because it's such a huge demographic, and, and you know the film industry by history and the depression and all those things is sort of bulletproof. It's a, it's, a, it's still a bargain entertainment sort of situation. It's more expensive than ever, but it's still $10, $12 a ticket. And the Latino you know, population is so enormous and growing in America that all the studios are trying to tap into that. And I don't think they've figured it out just quite yet. So uh, I think it'll evolve and get bigger and bigger. And uh, it's an evolving, untapped, you know, I have a friend who lives in Chicago, this producer who says he takes his son every Saturday morning to go see the first run picture, you know. And he says all the Latino families go, and it's like family of eight, and they're all in the movie theater on Saturday mornings. So it's a big demograph that I think is still trying to be, it's still a, a very huge market that's being figured out. But right, so, so it's a good idea now making films with the Spanish and English, kind of like the combination. I think so. I Great. Think so, but I, but they're not being made. You know, it's it's just not it's not it's not there yet. It's not there yet. Okay. Um, my friend Eugenio Derbez, who did uh, No Inclusions, uh, something. Um, he did the English and Spanish, and he's doing well, so that's why I was uh, asking. And um, here in Oklahoma, like you said, there were 
hundreds of families with their kids coming to see his film. So thank you. Sure. I mean, it, you know, it depends. I mean, they just did uh, Diego Luna directed um, Chavez. Chavez, which tanked. But I think that was just a bad film. I saw it. It wasn't very. It was okay. And they were hoping that that would just explode, and it didn't. So, and Chavez was a great story. Chavez and his, you know, oh, but it shit. didn't do well, it didn't perform. But films are, you know, all over the world. Uh, the, the, the Indian market, Bollywood, as it's called, huge. China, you're going to, huge. China's, China's a giant. China's Southeast Asia, three, Asia. Three billion, I just found this all out, three billion people in China, and a movie ticket is a different price in different regions, but the bare bottom is $20 a ticket. $20 a ticket, and they're slowly getting away from westernized uh, movies, and they're starting to make their own films because they're interested in, yeah, there's a lot of money in it. Oh, huge. Like they're, you know, three billion people. So, uh, you know, they're gonna go see Godzilla, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of, they lot of tickets. I had terrible news. I think we're about to the end of our session. So can I have a huge round of applause? For the